Uh, well, I'm, I, I started to experiment with tape recorders in 1960, 61. One of my one of my aunts in Manchester gave me a little tiny reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, one of the really early ones with batteries. And I immediately started to slow it down and speed it up with my fingers and and get the microphone to feedback and start to do little cut-ups with it and everything long before I heard of William Burroughs. But when I started to read William Burroughs books and so on, I, uh, I just in, in, innately, immediately grasped a lot of what he was suggesting in terms of the idea of the cut-ups and um, that if you take writing or music and chop it up and reassemble it in a random order, you often hear things or understand things that you wouldn't if you just looked at things in a linear way. And that basic technique of cutting up and reassembling is something I've used ever since. I was very lucky in 1970-71 that I, I came across William Burroughs' address in London where he was living at the time, wrote him a letter, and he wrote back and said, any time you're in London, just ring me and come visit. I'll pay for a taxi. So I hitchhiked down to London and rang him up, and he really did pick up the phone. And we became friends from then until he died. So I actually think of Burroughs and, and Brian Geisen, who also came up with the idea of the cut-ups with William as my my two most influential mentors in terms of art and music, really. TG was very much um, constructed to include, in a way for the first time, the idea of tape recordings and field recordings and cut-ups into the music itself, to take the lessons of the Beatniks and Stockhausen and John Cage and integrate them into a Western-based post-industrial form of music and see what would happen, what would come out of that experiment to break down the, the ongoing rhythm and blues roots, strip that away and take away the usual concerns with chords and rock and roll drumming rhythms and 4-4 four, four time and all that stuff and just say, wipe it clean and just treat every instrument as a noisemaker and there's no right or wrong way to play it, there's just sonics. What happens then? And what are the stories that make sense to me in my life now, in England in 1975? What, what actually is relevant to me? You know, it's not America in those days. Now it is, but not then. And it's not the cotton fields. It's not the Delta. It's not Eric Clapton. You know, it's not all those things. What is it that I feel right now? And I saw this very sterile, disintegrating, decaying industrial system that just didn't work and felt that there had to be a way to describe that that made sense with music. I think the best um, template that there was before Throbbing Gristle really was the Velvet Underground in terms of that. I think what they did with New York, we did with, with the rest and liberated, finally, uh, rhythm and lyric from any previous um, systems. And, and that's why we have industrial music today. It was actually us that named it. Isn't that funny? To know that you named a genre of music is a very weird thing. Very weird thing. Throbbing Gristle went from 1975 to 1981, at which point Something that you touched on before, Brad, was that there was this, this sense building up as more people got involved in, in, in what we called industrial music. It started to feel to me particularly that, that people were misunderstanding the journalistic approach. 
and were thinking that if they mentioned murderers or if they mentioned Nazis or if they mentioned something that was scary or shocking, that that was just an accessory that made what they did valid. And of course it's not the case, that's not what we were trying to do and people often forget that Throbbing Gristle did love songs and ambient music and funny songs like Something Came Over Me, Was It White and Sticky? Very anti-intellectual songs. Um, that there was a, a, a sort of a, a complete rainbow of emotions and ideas in Throbbing Gristle. It wasn't just one thing done to death, you know, just noise and screaming and, and shock. That, that's never been of, of interest to me in and of itself. And yet that was beginning to be how we were perceived or how we were, were sort of fitted into the musical context. And I didn't want it to be that way. I thought it's okay at the beginning to be angry, to be nihilistic, to be enraged because the world is full of hypocrites and it's full of lies and it's full of uh, particularly politicians and religious fools who who try and tell us how we're supposed to be and how we should evolve and how we shouldn't evolve and what we're entitled to do or not do with our bodies and our private lives. And there, no one has the right to tell anybody else what they do with their life or their imagination. So it seemed that from that moment of rage, there still has to be a time of becoming positive and looking for something to answer with for yourself, not even for anyone else. And I, I thought, ironically in a way, that the only answer I could see was to, to go back to whatever gave joy to me personally. What was it that made me happy when it happened to me? What made me excited? What made me feel compassion and hope, even optimism? And that was basically the psychedelic 60s. You know, I was very lucky because I was saying earlier that I saw all those beat groups in the early 60s. By the mid 60s and 67, I, I saw Pink Floyd with Sid Barrett five times in a year. Went to the UFO club. I saw Family and all these different bands. And, and that was what my record collection still was. It still is. I don't think I have almost nothing after 1971. I have hundreds of CDs and they start in 63 and they end in 71. It's, I have 18 incredible string band albums. And people find it weird. Like, how could you be in Throbbing Gristle and love the incredible string band? And I said, but of course. It's all psychedelic. You know, I think all great music is in one way or another psychedelic. So, Psychic TV was my answer to my own problem, my own question, which was what can we do to make things more positive. And one of the answers I came up with was not to assume that if people love the music it means anything special about you. But it gives you an opportunity to talk to extra people about ways to make life different. So we, we spend a lot of time writing serious sleeve notes and essays on the backs of albums and having a P.O. box and saying if you write to us We'll share our ideas about communal living, magic, um, how to do life differently, basically, and, and how to share instead of steal and be greedy. I'm going to make my mind.